Right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get going. The, uh, my name's Stuart Farr from EPAM Systems. I was going to be here with my colleague Ilya. He couldn't make it, um, and are going to talk about that subject on, on, the, on the screen there. And if there will be a small prize for anybody that can sensibly reduce the number of words in that to fit on one line. So I'm not going to read it out because it's too long, but that's what this is going to be about. Uh, I've got a few slides which I'll obviously go through now, but hopefully uh, time dependent, we'll get on to actually look at some of these applications and look at them in real time. So, so real stuff in other words, and maybe even some code. So um, just, just moving on. The Timebase CE or Community Edition, Timebase is, is a product that, that we, has been out there some time in a, in a, under a commercial license. So it's not a new product, it's new to the open source community. But essentially, it's a, it's a time series database and streaming system. And just to stop there for a little bit, normally that's a contradiction of terms when you say time series database and streaming system. Um, it is, um, and I'll come out come back on to why that is, why it is, and why that somewhat contradiction of terms is, is there. Um, it's been out there for uh, 15 years or so, and does things like um, the things listed there. But time series uh, analysis, backtesting, uh, algorithmic trading, things that are fundamentally are driven by, by time series data. And, and uh, um, it's got things like polymorphism in there, and rich data, we'll come onto the data in more, in more detail later on, but essentially it's time series data for financial services classically in, in the in backtesting and algorithmic trading world. Um, so been out there 15 years, we contributed it now to uh, the open source community uh, via Finos earlier this year, in fact, about three months ago. And I'll show you where the repo is and, and how you can get more information on it. But it is now, uh, as community edition, out there in the open source community. And, and we uh, you know, obviously hope people will um, deploy it and, and use it. But it has got a rich history. Um, just uh, that's uh, going into that a little bit more detail. Uh, so for those of you that are familiar with um, backtesting and the like, backtesting by definition is, is looking at historical data. Uh, the clue's in the name, as we say. But for algorithmic trading, then that is real time. And, and that sort of, not conflict, but that coexistence of historical data and real time data is, I'm not gonna say unique to the world of, of systematic or algorithmic trading, but it's certainly a very, very important feature. Um, and I mentioned earlier about it being both a uh, historical time series database and also real time streaming. And, uh, and we can see there we have some use cases where it is used for what used to be called complex event processing, which was its own domain a few years ago, but it's still done now, not used so much as a name, but the whole idea of, of real time event processing, um, where you define the events or the events are defined by somebody else, is, is a very real use case that we use uh, time base for. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, the history, I'm not going to go over all through that, but, but the most notable uh, thing on there I do want to point out is, is where we started about two years ago deploying on, on Kubernetes for the cl cloud, obviously. Um, that's, that was a big undertaking, undertaking for us, and essentially taking uh, a solution that was built in the world of private data centers and, and on-premise installations in very much into the cloud world where, where most of our deployments now are on one of the, uh, the various clouds, and, and Kubernetes was a big part of that. Um, we still have a number of, uh, a large number of installations in traditional uh, data centers on bare metal, but the cloud is very much um, where most of the action is now. So again, the final piece on there was the release to the open source community um, as Timebase uh, uh, CE. And I thought I'd just go through the reasons for this submission, and because because we, when I say we, we, this business unit within EPAM, we were acquired two years ago. So, so we are uh, a unit very much and fully part of EPAM, but Timebase was developed pre-EPAM in a traditional normal commercial software licensed company um, of 90 people plus minus. So we have, uh, we had, and we still have a number of engineers that were philosophically very much aligned with open source, but as a small, company with 90 people, we couldn't figure out sensibly how to do that uh, at a business level to make money from open source. Obviously, people do it. We knew people that do it, but it wasn't our MO, so we didn't do it. Um, once we became part of EPAM, EPAM is very supportive 
of the open source community and, and from a business model perspective, it very much um, goes along with it. You heard Chris earlier today hopefully talk about um, how we view open source in EPAM. And, and so with strong support and a commercial business model, it was a natural step for us to release to the open source community. Uh, in terms of resources, uh, we'll actually dig into these later, hopefully, um, time permitting. But timebase.info is publicly uh, accessible. There's a lot of information on there. Some people say too much. Um, there's literally um, the architecture, the, the, the file system, how it's, how it's um, formed, how it's configured. The APIs are on there. On well, one of the earlier slides, they uh, mentioned about Java, C Sharp, uh, sorry, .NET, C++, and Python. APIs are all up there and a stack of other documentation. Uh, and the repo is there um, as well for, for actually accessing the code and, and the other documentation that the Finos uh, the, uh, there. So one of the things uh, the title is about using time series data and time based in that for analytic applications. So just talking a little bit about looking at the types of, of time series data that exist. Uh, in financial services, we tend to always think about market data because it's fundamental and indeed is the bedrock of any financial, app, well not any, but most financial applications. Um, orders and executions, of course, are up there. Earnings data, other sort of fundamental data is up there as well. But then less obvious, maybe, uh, analytics on the IT stack. That's particularly important in the in the high frequency trading world where you need to know where your latencies are coming from. So that sort of metadata, if you will, is classically um, analyzed in time series data to actually understand where your latencies are and how to improve them. Uh, less obvious, but equally, not equally important, but from a, another dimension, if you will, whether other types of data, some people call it alternative data, of course, but whether stats on weather patterns, uh, both forecasts and historical, uh, consumption data from stores, whether it's aggregated or individual stores or companies, I should say. Satellite data was very uh, prevalent a few years ago. Basically, firms were um, taking pictures of parking lots of big, well-known retail stores and then selling that data and people making predictions on earnings based on how full the parking lots were, um, which sort of worked for a little while and then didn't work. Um, and news, uh, news data, social media sentiment from news and, and uh, social media is used for generating trading signals and putting other um, context into other events that are going on. So all of those are time series data, less obvious maybe, but very important. And people are trading and generating trading signals based on those other types of data in addition to market data, not instead of, because it's all predicated on making some uh, either prediction or correlation with market data. So market data is still very important and fundamental but we shouldn't forget these other types. Uh, and in the context of time-based, that's very important because one of the things that is, is fundamental to time-based, the community edition in particular, is defining your own data structures. So it doesn't just assume that time series in, in, in financial, uh, data, financial services is market data. You can define your own data structures and schemas for these other types of data and others that, uh, that are not up there. Um, and in terms of um, what operations this data is used for, time series data is used for, we tend to think of, or we don't, or I do, tend to think of operations using historical data or, or uh, real time. And, and there, again, that's by no means close to being exhaustive, but TCA would be a classic example of using historical data to analyze the performance of order execution. Been around a long time, um, it's very simple to do, but requires historical market data. Backtesting, by definition, is historical market data. Uh, value at risk via historical simulation, the bedrock of banks risk for, for many years is by definition on historical data, trade surveillance is. And then if we look at what uses real time data, we sort of actually see a lot of the same words and that's not surprising. So front office risks by definition, real time risk requires real time data. Running algos by definition is operating on real, real time data. Trade surveillance, trying to capture bad stuff going on in real time and of course complex event processing. So the reason for sort of putting those up there is essentially it's highlighting the fact that we have a simultaneous use of both historical and real time data. And going back to the point I made at the beginning about time series data is sometimes thought of as dump it into time series data warehouse, we'll do some historical analysis, and that's it. 
um, and that's not it. It's very much this idea of a simultaneous use of historical and real-time data. And at an engineering level, that's not trivial. So if you've got a lot of data measured in terabytes typically, um, and millions of messages per second, often in terms of frequency of updates on new data points, and you're piecing that together with real time. In other words, it's coming in very quickly, building up very quickly, but you also need a historical context. To manage those two concepts is non-trivial. It's done, it's doable. There are lots of people, not lots, but there are several people who do it very well. Uh, time, uh, Timebase is one of those, and it's now open source. So, um, so this is just a schematic way of looking at that, this idea of, of historical data and, and real time, and real time as soon as it's come in is now historical, of course. So we have this concept essentially of a moving window, a moving window of time, and in that moving window at any one point in time is a, is a set of data. And, and, and keeping track of that moving window of a, a set of data, whether that's measured in milliseconds or seconds or days or months or years, doesn't matter. The concept of there is this moving window. So when we do very simple math functions like moving averages um, of the various flavors, um, various technical indicators, they implicitly need or explicitly need both this concept of real-time data and historical just to keep up to date. And again, we'll look at, for, we'll look at some of those um, in, in a minute and we'll uh, actually being used. So this concept of the moving window and stitching together real time and historical is, is pretty fundamental to applications um, in financial services. Um, and looking at uh, what users expect nowadays, again, this is all in an analytical concept. The idea of giving somebody a screen to put in some numbers and press a button and get an answer is, would be nice if it still existed. It tends not to. Of course, um, people uh, particularly now are using Python to do their own analytics. And, and therefore is very free form. You can't predict what they're going to do. You can't predict what data they're going to need. You're going to, you can't predict how, how often or how, how much they're going to need. So Python, Jupyter Notepad, Kafka at more the data structure level, tools that should be or are supported um, by us and sort of need to be supported along the idea of giving, you're not restricting what um, a, a user can do, an analytical user can do. Uh, we also, the expectation now is, of course, that that is available anywhere. So uh, web deliverable um, feature, web deliverable functionality, I should say. Obviously, the cloud is sort of part and parcel of that very much so. Uh, but the, ho the whole point here is that we, we have to support various different types of data, different frequencies, different contents, different amounts, and different analytics to satisfy and to, to give power users, power analytical users, what they need. And that, that's a challenge, but that's what we um, I mentioned, at the, not at the beginning, but near the beginning about the last two years, we've made uh, Timebase very much a cloud deployed platform, really in part to support uh, some of these um, expectations. And that sort of brings us to um, building or designing applications for analytics uh, using some of these um, in, in this context. So one of the things that used to, and still does, I should say, occur is when, is when processing was done on the server that hosted the data. So the classic Oracle, Sybase, RDMSs, very data-centric, very processing-centric on the server. So you basically did the math, you did the, you did the calculations on the server, and you, and you delivered the results. Very efficient from a speed of processing perspective, not very good from a flexibility perspective, but the bedrock of many bank systems today still. Or do you do the opposite of that? Do you essentially say, I'm not gonna do anything to the data, I'm just gonna send it out and you deal with it as you wish. So you're delegating all of the analytics and the processing to the consumer. And that's obviously very much uh, the Python world where they can do, uh, have to do very powerful analytics, but, but you're essentially asking the users to do a lot and, and stripping down the data server to something just streaming data. And then obviously there's a hybrid between the two where you may be doing things like filtering a data set. And the example we often talk about here, if you subscribe to the market data from the CME, that's a lot of information coming in very quickly across various markets of energy and, and, and classically and, and commodities, obviously. So you may just be dealing in energy or, or some subset of energy and, and only want contracts pertaining to energy or, or commodities. So you may filter the data set and then just deal with the relevant amount to you, but still do your analytics at your end. So that would be a, a fairly simple but um, quite well used example of hybrid processing between the server 
and the consumer. And then data compression comes very much into um, where are you doing that compression? Well, you're presumably doing it on the disk, so you're, you're crunching down your raw data into something that stores less than its natural format, its text format. But also, if you're delivering that over the internet or not, you may be compressing, you may want to, and doubtless will want to compress the data before it goes out of, of a data center. Um, and then, but what does that add in terms of latency? Compression obviously has a cost. So, so these are, there's obviously no one answer here, but these are things that are fundamental to um, designing applications uh, for analytics that are, that are cloud delivered or, or running on the cloud. Um, and with that, I'm going to actually, we're going to run some examples and have some real time, hopefully real time. We'll see, we'll see what works and what doesn't work. Um, just while I'm, I'm going to change over to the browser, any questions that anybody has, please just um, fire away. Just before I do the um, do some example analytics, this is I put this up earlier, the timebase.info, but this is um, where I was mentioning there's a lot of information here, uh, particularly under the documentation. We've got the APIs uh, the, uh, there under developer documentation. Just while we're here, I will just very quickly show this architecture of, of what, um, what we have. And this idea of um, one of the things I mentioned about this idea of having a messaging system alongside uh, uh, as part and parcel of a time series data database is, is this concept of, of having persistence or not, we, what we call durable streams, and that is what it says. I mean, your data is stored and available um, now and in the future, or transient streams where you're just essentially using it as a memory broker. That's part of the configuration. So, that's a, so you can see there uh, almost that it's a very it's a very stripped down system. It does what it does very well, but it doesn't do a lot of things that other systems, RDMSs particularly, would do. So the filtering I meant touched on earlier, that's this, um, we call it QQL. I'll show, maybe show some examples of that. QQL, you can guess what the QL stands for. The Q is quant, so quant query language is, you can guess what that sort of is, but it's, it's, it's sort of simple um, SQL-like syntax to do classically filtering but normal grouping types of data, some pre-processing, if you will, before you stream the data out to a consumer. Anyway, that's timebase.info. Um, a lot of information there. Some people say too much, but it is what it is. Yes. Yes, stream based in a Palmer on the CP side, absolutely, all the time. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, um, thank you. Yes, our commercial past, it sounds, uh, you know, it's the, a different, different time as they say. So this is a, a very simple um, front end application that is, as you can probably guess, showing uh, market data from, in this particular case, it's NYMEX. So um, we've got some contracts there. Uh, CL is some crude um, contract, I'm not sure which month, uh, crude oil contract. And here we've got, um, I'm just going to just go back a step. So we've got the, 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 these, as many other time series do, call them streams. So this particular data structure called NIMAX is um, not surprisingly holding data from the market called NIMAX. But we can use this to, to look at the schema. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can create your own data structures and schemas to reflect data that's not just market data, but other data that's, that may not be that common. Uh, you can define schemas, and, and what we're looking at here is a graphical, uh, a visual representation of the definition of this particular uh, schema for, for, for supporting uh, NYMEX market data. But again, this is all user-driven. Um, if we look at the data itself, um, I'm going to go back to this uh, if I can get there, this contract. Yes, of course. Go back to. Well, if in doubt, move to the next one. So I'll do the same thing here. So this is a different data stream. It's a similar UI, as you can see. Now we're looking at uh, crypto data from the exchange or trading venue Kraken for, for one of the many uh, crypto venues, and here we're looking at historical data. We're looking at uh, today, actually, but starting off from 7.40 this morning, this is just charting 
charting data historically, but uh, we presumably want to, the whole point of this is talking about analytics, real time analytics and historical. So this is real time, this is the Bitcoin price from Kraken right now, updating in real time. So you see this thing flashing every time it has an update. The actual data itself is in this fairly complex, I talked about poly, very briefly touched on polymorphism earlier, but here's the fairly complex data structure storing an actual incremental update of the order book. So this is, this is the level two, it, buried in here it says level two update. So basically what's going on here is we're getting incremental updates of the order book from Kraken for BTC USD in real time. So, so that moving window, this is it real time. And then literally as soon as it's updated, we get the historical view. So this is the history of going back to the, the, the last week or the, the week before. So that history is obviously by definition building up in real time. And the same APIs, this is obviously an API um, populating a screen, is the same API whether you're looking at the data a second ago a month ago, a year ago, or real time. You're subscribing to the same data. So from an analytical perspective, given that most, as I mentioned earlier, many functions, many math functions are implicitly using both um, real time and, and historical data simultaneously, it sort of follows that you need one API and you don't have to worry about is that history, is that now? So this is showing you that in, albeit in a, in a simple use case. I'm gonna move on now to so I, some of you may have been to the Grafana folks earlier talking about their tools. This is Grafana's um, sort of, I'm not going to say flagship, it's not for me to say that, but this is a, a, a very popular uh, and for good reason, uh, again, obviously a graphical user interface for showing both historical and real time time series. So again, this is real time. This is uh, BTC USD again. Um, on the top left here, we have simple bars, um, these are, I think, five minute bars. We can change the um, granularity of them. And it moves every now and again as, as a bar fills up and time, time moves on. Below here, we have volume, again, fairly, fairly usual. On the right hand side here, um, this is a little bit more interesting because we have some simple analytics. So I don't know whether you can, whether you can see those, but um, we've got uh, SMA, CMA and EMA. So simple compound and exponential moving averages being calculated, which again, by definition, have a moving window of time, both real time and historic, the, the, the moving window as time goes through. And, and we can see that moving as time moves on. And if we look at here, we can see some of the simple scripting language that allows us to do that. Um, you can see there, again, it's very simple SQL-like language defining these moving averages, which is very simple for the very simple reason is our source of data is being updated in real time and having that history. So that means that the person doing the analytics, the consumer is doing the analytic, but hasn't got to worry about the timestamp on the data because the same API is giving them real time, giving you real time and historic. So with that, um, that's about our time slot. Any, any, that was all I was going to say formally, but any questions? Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah, we call that warm up. So, so do I, am, am I going back 50 microseconds, 50? Yeah. Yes, it's a parameter. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good question because one of the things we, we did, again, moving more on the analytics moving away from the time-based side of things, the analytics themselves can use a lot of data. So if you've got market data coming in at millions of messages per second, which is quite typical, or not typical, but is not unusual, I should say, then your analytic itself has to be pretty powerful, otherwise it's gonna choke. So you can either solve that in probably more than two ways, but at least two ways. One is you can say, I can only cope with 100,000 a second, I'm gonna throw out every other every 10th, I'm only going to take every 10th line in that stream. That's a fairly crude way, but works. Um, or you can have a very fast analytic that can beat that. And, and so we, our engineers, of course, did both. Uh, and we have very fast analytics to not choke on data, but also throttle it back as well for, for where we're providing analytics that can't take that sort of, uh, take that sort of volume. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. I'll just leave it on timebase.info, but uh, 
for more information, but uh, any questions, uh, please ask afterwards. Thank you.